Oh, we will continue <laughs> talking about eigenvalues and eigenvectors today. Uh, here, not to have my class notes. Give me a second. From memory. So we're going to state a pretty major theorem. Um, and this is going to relate eigenvalues to the determinant. Um, so this theorem says that, let's see. Well, let's start with an argument. Say that lambda is an eigenvalue. That is to say that A minus lambda I times V equals zero has non-trivial solutions. Those non-trivial solutions being the eigenvectors. Well, the invertible matrix theorem says that A minus lambda I times a vector equals zero has non-trivial solutions if and only if A minus lambda I is singular, which is a fancy way of saying that it has no inverse. Per the chapter three material, a matrix is singular if and only if its determinant is zero. So lambda is an eigenvalue if and only if the determinant of A minus lambda I equals zero. And now it turns out that the determinant of A minus lambda I is a polynomial in lambda. I mean, so for example, if A equals one, two, four, three, then A minus lambda I, we're going to see stuff that looks like this a lot. And at this point, I'm going to sort of start doing it quickly. Remember that I has ones down the diagonal. So lambda i just has lambdas down the diagonal. So a minus lambda i puts negative lambdas on the diagonal and leaves the rest of the elements alone. And the determinant of A minus lambda I is multiply for a two by two. This is straightforward. Multiply the diagonal elements. Multiply. 
multiply the anti-diagonal elements and subtract. We get lambda squared minus lambda minus three lambda minus four lambda minus eight. So we see here that the determinant of a minus lambda i is a polynomial. When I say in lambda, I mean that lambda is the variable here. So, the eigenvalues are the roots of this polynomial. And if A is N by N, this polynomial is nth degree. Now, A was two by two, we got a second degree polynomial. And this polynomial has a name. It is called the characteristic polynomial. So in the classrooms um, and textbooks and so forth, characteristic polynomials are how we find eigenvalues. We find the characteristic polynomial, we set it equal to zero, and we solve it. I mean, that's outside of classrooms, that's a deeply flawed process because we've seen that in general, we can't find determinants. At least we can't find determinants quickly. And um, there are other issues as well related to numerical stability. But, you know, for the little two by two matrices, and even for a three by three matrix in a pinch, <laughs> that we work with in the textbook, in the classroom. This is a way of finding eigenvalues. And outside of this, of the classroom, this still has some very interesting implications. For example, Theorem, if A is N by N, A has at most N eigenvalues. because a polynomial of degree n can have at most n roots. Theorem. Every matrix and just like we did with inverses, you know, we're going to be working with square matrices in this chapter because square matrices are the only matrices that have eigenvalues. So I might sometimes forget to explicitly write it, but that's what I'm talking about here. Every matrix has 
at least one eigenvalue. Maybe a complex eigenvalue, but every matrix has at least one eigenvalue. And we're going to see that having complex eigenvalues is an interesting case. This is possibly the first class in the math major where we'll actually see applications of complex numbers. And then if you sort of, if you put these theorems together, or not quite put them together, but closely related to those two theorems, Counting with multiplicity every N by N matrix as N Eigen values. And you know, just uh, the 10 second reminder of what we mean by that. If something's an eigen, if, um, if a polynomial has a root, like if two is our root, that tells us how that polynomial factors. If two is a root, then if P of X is factored, there's gonna be an X minus two. And if negative three is our root, there'll be an X plus three. And maybe you factor a polynomial and it looks like this. And that x minus two term shows up twice. Then um, x then two is said to be a root of multiplicity two, and negative three is a root of multiplicity one. And if you add the multiplicities together, you get the degree of p of x. So again, this is a statement about polynomials. Um, I hope it's I, I hope it's clear because we can think of eigenvalues as roots of polynomials when we talk about the multiplicity of an eigenvalue. We're just talking about its multiplicity as a root of a polynomial. So, example, I don't want to accidentally put something up with complex roots. I don't want to deal with that right now. I'll copy from my class notes and let me get the calculator loading up, we're going to want that. Let's say we have this matrix, one, five, two, negative one. Let's find the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors. So give this a name, call it A. 
to find the eigenvalues, we find the eigenvalues first, always. We need to look at the determinant of A minus lambda I. Let's switch notation here. The minus lambda I puts negative lambdas on the diagonal, but leaves the rest of the matrix alone. And because this is just a two by two matrix, Finding the eigenvalues, well, finding the determinant, first of all, is relatively straightforward. Multiply the diagonals, multiply the anti-diagonals, said it was straightforward, but then wrote down a mistake. Multiply the diagonals and the anti-diagonals and subtract. We get... Lambda squared, negative lambda times negative lambda. Let's see, minus lambda plus lambda. So the lambdas go away. Minus one, minus 10, lambda squared minus 11. So we're going to get messy eigenvalues, but um, the eigenvalues are the roots of this polynomial. Good. Maybe review the quadratic formula, but it's not necessary here. Lambda squared, lambda not squared. Lambda is plus or minus the square root of 11. So we have two eigenvalues. What about eigenvectors? Well, we have to deal with eigenvectors, one eigenvalue at a time. So let's say lambda equals the square root of 11. To find the eigenvectors, we need to solve A, minus lambda i times v equals zero. A minus the square root of 11 is lambda. A minus the square root of 11 times i. Again, this is all affecting the diagonal and nothing else. The diagonal elements get negative square roots of 11 attached to them. The anti-diagonal elements are left alone. And we're solving this equal to zero. And this would be clearly a mess to do by hand, but technology will come to the rescue, I hope. So one minus the square root of 11. So the matrix menu, right, and we're messing around with big matrices. 
Now we just need two by three. Let's try that again. Clear out that 30, put in a three. So we have one minus the square root of 11. It uh, keeps a great number of decimal places. You can't see it when this isn't highlighted, but I wouldn't expect any rounding error with all of this. So one minus the square root of 11, five, zero. Then the two, negative one minus the square root of 11, zero, and hopefully there's going to be a little enough rounding error that when we perform Gauss-Jordan elimination on this, fantastic. I knew because the every eigenvalue has an infinite number of eigenvectors, I knew from the start that the second row had to turn all to zero so that the second variable would be free. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, thanks to the square root of 11, this lengthy decimal is not, it's not a rational number. It's not any kind of nice fraction. Maybe we could write it in terms of the square root of 11, but that would require a more powerful computer algebra system than a TI-84 calculator. Um, I'll keep the first three decimal places. Negative two point one five eight. So remember how this works. I, people did seem to when I asked you know people to find no spaces on the test. We're looking for a vector V here. The columns of the matrix give the coefficients of that vector, except for the last column, which is a quality. V1 <clears throat> minus 2.158 V2 equals zero. V1 equals 2.158 V2. And in general, I mean, I'm sure there are exceptions, but in general, when we're interested in finding eigenvectors, we're going to want specific eigenvectors. That is to say, we don't need to find the infinitely many eigenvectors. We're happy if we can just write one now most of the time. So I'm going to look at this equality and I'm going to say, well, if V2 were one and V1 were two, 
0.158. That would be an eigenvalue. Sorry, an eigenvector. Um, for the other eigenvalue, it also has an eigenvector. Same thing. Lambda equals negative the square root of 11. So we'd remember that minus a minus is a plus. So a minus negative the square root of 11 i simplifies to this. So one and negative one on the diagonal get a square root of 11. Uh, the two and the five are left alone. We want the determinant of this. I re-update, I would remove these brackets and replace them with the proper determinant notation, which is vertical bars. I guess that's clear enough. What am I doing? I totally uh, let my mind wander and did something irrelevant. I mean, this is as if I'm trying to find the eigenvalues a second time. That's not, of course, what we're doing. Sorry about that. What we're doing is we're looking at a minus lambda i times v equals zero, and we're trying to solve for v. And we've already done lambda equals was positive the square root of 11. So now we'll look at negative the square root of 11. So one plus the square root of 11, negative one plus the square root of 11, uh, 2, 5. We're setting this equal to 0. Back to the calculator. it out, RREF this, the advantage of just overriding A over and over again. Um, so once again, our bottom row has turned to zero. If you ever do this process and you only get a single solution, something has gone wrong. Um, either it wasn't what you thought is an eigenvalue wasn't, or you messed up the a minus lambda i, or entered it into your calculator wrong, or something. One 
let's see, B1 plus 1.158, B2 equals 0, B1 equals negative 1.158, V2. And again, in this context, we are usually looking for a solution. <laughs> So we're not, you know, buffering in V2 equals V2 and then rewriting it. We'll just say, I mean, the way I normally do this is V2 equals 1. V1 is negative 1.158. There are an infinite number of ways of doing this. I mean, if you really wanted to that V2 would be five, you could. You'd have to go to your calculator for five times negative 1.158. But um, the only illegal choice is zero. V2 can't be zero because that would give you zero, zero as an eigenvector. Any questions so far? And we will be doing examples of this in the homework. I'll move on. Still in the same section, though. But uh, a new topic. Sim hilarity. So again, the way similarity is going to be used in the next section is very different from the way it tends to be used in the real world, but it's an important definition. And I mean, looking ahead slightly, similarity is used in one of the classic eigenvalue finding algorithms. And this is a good time to mention that in general, there is no way to find eigenvalues by hand, so we need to numerically approximate them. And what makes this a good time is that we've just seen that finding eigenvalues is the same as solving polynomial equations. And we are we've probably at some point been told that for degree five or higher, there's no way to solve an arbitrary polynomial equation by hand. That was a major result of the French mathematician Evray Galois, who founded this new branch of mathematics when he was like. 20 or something, which deeply offensive to me, but um, similarity. So when you see the definition, it's not going, I think, to be obvious that this has anything to do with anything, but two matrices, 
A and B are similar if there is another matrix P such that and the order here doesn't matter, but I'll use the order in the book such that A equals P times B times P inverse. If you opened a different textbook, this is what I meant when I was saying that order doesn't matter. If you opened a different textbook, you might see similarity defined like that with the P inverse first. It does not matter where the P inverse is, and that's because if A equals P times B times P inverse, then A also equals P inverse inverse times B times P inverse. So if you then define, if you call P inverse C, A equals was C inverse times B times C. So where the inverse goes doesn't matter, but we'll try just because we like to be consistent with the textbook, we'll try to remember to use that order with the inverse coming second. So this, uh, this word similarity, two matrices that are similar should be similar. They should have something in common. From this definition, it's probably not at all obvious that A and B should have anything in common. The major result of similarity is that similar matrices have the same eigenvectors. If A and B are similar, they have the same eigenvectors and the eigenvectors have the same mult ipsicity. And I can I can sort of prove this. Um, I say sort of because I'm really just kicking the can down the road a bit. Um, when we introduced determinants, when we introduced determinants, I made a statement without proof that debt A B equals debt A times debt B. And I didn't prove that, but if you're willing to accept that it is true, that's that A 
B P times B times P inverse. Then that A, then let's look at A minus lambda I. We won't take the determinant just yet. We'll just look at what this matrix is. So the identity matrix can be gotten by taking any matrix and multiplying it by its inverse. So that's right, I as P times P inverse. And because A is similar, to be, and we have this equality, we can write this as P times B times P inverse minus lambda times P times P inverse. We can pull the P's out in front. Um, we have to be careful with this kind of thing because matrix multiplication doesn't commute. So like if one of the P's was stuck behind another matrix, we wouldn't be able to pull it to the left because that involves make, uh, multiplication commuting. Um, fortunately, that's not the case here. This P's out in front. And aside from a scalar, which we can move around this piece out in front. So just like we pulled that P out in front, we'll um, pull that P inverse to the right. We're going to perform the same trick here that we've seen already. If we just instantly pulled this P out, we, this P inverse out, sorry, we'd get B minus lambda, which would be a problem. But we can think of the identity matrix I as being there because multiplying by I doesn't do anything. And then we're left with B minus lambda I times P inverse. So all of those intermediate steps are now irrelevant. What we want is that that first thing I circled equals that second thing I circled. A minus lambda I equals P times uh, B minus lambda I times P inverse. So if these two things are equal, their determinants are surely equal. And here's where I'm going to use the fact that the determinant of a product is the product of the determinants. And now I'll mess around a little. Um, 
What we have now, the determinant of P is just a number. The determinant of P inverse is just a number. The determinant of B minus lambda I is a polynomial. So we've now got our standard multiplication here. Everything commutes. We can move the determinant of P next to the determinant of P inverse. And now, rather than keep copying stuff, I'm going to the determinant of P. The determinant of a product is the product of the determinants. Well, the opposite is therefore true. The determinant of P times the determinant of P inverse is the determinant of P times P inverse, which is the determinant of I. And because I is triangular, in fact, it's both upper and lower triangular, the determinant is the product of the diagonal elements, which is one. So we're multiplying by one. And I don't want to fuss with the eraser in its current state. I'll just scribble it out. The determinant of A minus lambda I equals the determinant of B minus lambda I. That is to say that A and B have the same characteristic polynomials. And because the polynomials are the same, they have the same roots with the same multiplicities. And I'm going to, because it's so closely related to this, I'm not going to go into the next section with um, just this amount of time left, but I will preview it. A matrix A is a said to be diagonalizable if A equals P times D times P inverse where D is a diagonal matrix. A diagonal matrix is one that's both upper and lower triangular. It can have non-zero entries on the diagonal, but it's zero everywhere else. That is to say that A is diagonalizable if A is similar to a diagonal matrix. And again, this isn't quite what textbooks do because textbooks assume we're working by hand or with a calculator without an advanced computer algebra system, which is correct in our case. Um, but the, um, the A and D have the same eigenvalues. And if a matrix is triangular, the eigenvalues are just the entries on the diagonal. Well, a diagonal matrix 
matrix is certainly triangular. So the eigenvalues of A run down the diagonal of D. And what we're going to do tomorrow is say, okay, we'll start with A, we'll find its eigenvalues, then we'll, not tomorrow, but Thursday, we'll start with A, we'll find its eigenvalues, then we'll use the eigenvalues to diagonalize the thing. Again, that's kind of backwards. The real application of this is that you can run a computer algorithm that will diagonalize A. And once A is diagonalized, you can read the eigenvalues off. It's an eigenvalue finding algorithm. So more on that Thursday when we cover the relevant section. <laughs>